Bibles up to Joshua chapter 23, and I will begin story time. We'll take these chapters one at a time, I think. Um, you know, you know, maybe not. I may just want to go ahead and read both of these chapters. It's not terribly long. Let's just see what we got here. Okay. Would you um, just nod your heads if you can see the slide? Okay, excellent, excellent. All right. So here is Joshua's slide. And then, yeah, I'll, I think that I will just go ahead and read both chapters 23 and 24. And we'll just move through this. So here's where it starts in chapter 23, verse 1. Now, it came about after many days when Yuvah had given rest to Israel from all their enemies on every side, and Joshua was old, advanced in years, that Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders and their heads and their judges and their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in years, and you have seen all that Yuvah your God has done to all these nations because of you. For Yuvah your God is the one who has been fighting for you. Behold, I have apportioned to you these nations which remain as an inheritance for your tribes to all the nations which I have cut off from the Jordan even to the great sea toward the setting of the sun. Yuvah your God, he will thrust them out from before you and drive them from before you and you will possess their land just as Yuvah your God promised you. Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the Torah of Moshe, so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or mention the name of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you are to cling to Yuvah your God as you have done to this day. For Yuvah has driven out great and strong nations from before you. And as for you, no man has stood before you to this day. One of your men puts to flight a thousand. For Yuvah your God is he who fights for you, just as he promised you. So take diligent heed to yourselves to love Yuvah your God. For if you ever go back and cling to the rest of these nations, the remainder of these nations, which remain among you, and intermarry with them, so that you associate with them and they with you, Know with certainty that Yuvah your God will not continue to drive these nations out from before you, but they will be a snare and a trap to you and a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good land which Yuvah your God has given you. Now behold, today I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls, that not one word of all the good words which Yuvah your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. It shall come about that just as all the good words which Yuvah your God spoke to you have come upon you, so Yuvah will bring upon you all the threats until he has destroyed you from off this good land which Yuvah your God has given you. When you transgress the covenant of Yuvah your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of Yuvah will burn against you, and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. And here's Joshua chapter 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says Yuvah, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor. Hold on, I apologize, I'm letting someone in. There you go. Father of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. No, yes. And to Esau I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I, went, I sent Moses and Aaron and plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst. And afterward I brought you out. 
I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And Egypt pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to you, Va, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who lived beyond the Jordan, and they fought with you. And I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land when I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel, and he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam. So he had to bless you, and I delivered you from his hand. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Thus I gave them into your hand. Then I sent the hornet before you, and it drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities which you had not built, and you have lived in them. You are eating of vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore fear Yuva and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve Yuva. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve Yuva, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, which they served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yuva. The people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake Yuva to serve other gods. For Yuva, our God, is the one who brought us up and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went, and for among all the peoples through whom we, whose midst we passed. Yuva drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve Yuva, for he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, You will not be able to serve Yuva, for he is holy. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake Yuva and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve Yuva. And Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen for yourselves Yuva to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away the foreign gods which are in your midst and incline your hearts to Yuva, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve Yuva, our God, and we will obey his voice. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the Torah of God. And he took a large stone and he set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of Yuva. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be for a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of Yuva which he spoke to us. Thus it shall be for a witness against you, so that you do not deny your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to his inheritance. It came about after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Yuva, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath Serah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, on the north of Mount Gaash. And Israel served Yuva all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua and had known the de all the deeds of Yuva which he had done for Israel. Now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money. And they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in Gebeah of Pincus, his son, which was given him in the hill country of Ephraim. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the book of Joshua. Now there is greetings, Tracy. Delightful to see you. There is a, a good amount of, of information there. But it's not a lot of new information. We have seen a lot of this stuff before. We've seen a renewal of the covenant. We've seen the promises of God um, presented. So we 
We've seen some of this stuff before, and I don't think we need to delve too deeply into it. However, there are quite a few nuggets of really powerful information and wisdom here in these sections that I, I want to dig through. So backing up to chapter 23, I want to make a couple of, um, a couple of points here in this regard. Uh, number one, it, you know, right at the beginning of Joshua, I, I have called chapter 23 Joshua's warning and farewell. Um, these are like his personal remarks. In chapter 24, you saw that these were basically words from Yovah. Uh, he, Joshua himself, did say some words of his own in chapter 24, but that was mostly, thus saith Yovah, most of that was. Um, so right at the beginning, uh, oops, right at the beginning of chapter 23, we can see the character of the farewell that Joshua is giving them. And I would just bring out a couple of points here. Uh, number one, what is Mike Tim coming on separately? What's up? He can't hang out with his own wife? What is she, two rooms over? <laughs> We're both running behind today, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm delighted to see you here anyhow, uh, even if you're not in the same room. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, 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 the tone of this, this farewell address is interesting in that he, he is attempting to prepare them spiritually, I think. I, would kinda, I have kind of made a note to myself that this is likened unto the training wheels coming off. You know, they have had the house of Aaron, you know, I, I don't know why, but I have this, this suspicion that while they were in Egypt, the house of Aaron had already begun, become, begun to be elevated somewhat, and that the tribes in the, in the days of trouble that they went through prior to the, I want to call it the advent of Moses, um, that they were, you know, really, as they were experiencing their difficulties, they probably learned to rely on um, the tribe of Aaron, and especially, you know, I, I think that they had already established themselves. And uh, I think that the, the, uh, the Talmud actually kind of mentions some of those things. But they had that leadership structure. And when they left Egypt, they had Moses. I mean, this is the guy, this is the great prophet who is really tight with Yuvah, and he hears directly from Yuvah. Um, and Joshua, to a somewhat lesser degree, obviously, but he's definitely hearing directly from Yuvah. But now I think they're going to be relying on the structures that they put into place. They have heard this word repeatedly over the last, I am assuming now that, and this is kind of calculating based upon Joshua's age, I assume that he had to have been 20 years old or possibly 25 years old when they left Egypt because he's got to be a certain age in order to fight in the military, right? Isn't that, uh, that's, I believe that's 20. Uh, is anybody nodding head, shaking heads? Is it 20 or 25? I think it's 20. I don't think you can be a priest in service until you are 25, but you can serve in the army if you are 20. I think it's 30 for a priest, but it is, it is 20 for the army. Okay. So, yeah, so they've got, uh, you know, he had to have been 20 at least when he left Egypt, and he sounds like he was kind of in charge of the military so he may have even been, it'd be kind of weird. It'd be kind of weird if, I mean, when you remember when, uh, what is the name of that roving band of weirdos who attacked them in the wilderness? The Amalekites. You know, when the Amalekites attacked, it sounds to me like Joshua was leading the army. And that's, um, that would be unusual to be leading the army when you're only 20 years old. So I, I, I would assume that he had possibly been a little bit older and might have even had some kind of military experience. I'm not sure. But uh, let's just say he was 25. So they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. That's going to make him 60, 65. What are you laughing at, Tracy? <laughs> Okay, that's fine. You guys got inside jokes going. If you feel like sharing, you can send a text message or something. That's delightful. Um, but I feel like he, you know, after 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness, 
he's going to be 65 or something, and now he's 110. And the text right at the beginning tells us that some time had passed. So I'm assuming that, you know, another 40 years has gone by and he's getting old and he's going to crash. He's going to cash in his chips. And uh, Eliezer, the priest, is going to be, that is the social structure. So he's giving them instructions for how to live this life once this direct um, interceding person is gone which is himself. I, I mean, I, my understanding is that from this point forward, you've got the priest who's going to be relying on the Urim and the Tumim in order to hear directly from God. And I, you know, this is it's kind of mysterious about what that Umi, or Urim and Tumim is, but it sounds like a yes or no, on or off, you know, binary kind of a, a revelation, uh, except in the case of some of these judges who heard from Yuvah and began to uh, lead Israel in times of distress. So these people are really uh, taking the training wheels off, and they're going to have to learn to, to stand up and fend for themselves. And I think what's also interesting and important here is he gives no civic or governmental instructions. It is purely spiritual instructions. It is purely instructions from the Torah. And I think that's instructive that if you, I mean, it's, it's, it seems pretty clear to me that if you had no governing document in a society other than the Torah of Moses, do you think you could run a society? Do you think you could have a successful society if the, if the whole place was run just using the five books of Moses? Yes. Absolutely. I, and I think, you know, do you need judges do you need a, a Bet Dean or a Sanhedrin or something like that? Yes, probably, because it's not t totally uh, explicated to where it gives you an example of everything that you should do in every situation. It gives some very broad and strong principles. And yeah, you'll have to work out a lot of details amongst yourselves and rely upon the word of uh, the, the spirit of God to guide you, just like you do now. There are lots and lots of examples of specific instances where you should do this or you should not do that in the Bible. But, you know, especially in our day and age, as technology has changed, you know, human behavior hasn't really changed. There are new circumstances that we need to apply the Torah to. But he's giving them pure spiritual instruction here from the Torah. He's not telling them anything about setting up courts or how, to, how the place is going to be governed. It's just cling to Yovah with all your hearts, cling to his word and everything is going to be fine. I believe that firmly. So in, in, in verses 1 through 3 of 23, we're, we're really going to begin to govern ourselves. We have to. And I think, go ahead. Yeah, on Judges 11, um, if you take a second to look at that, you'll see it says, after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, which tribe should go to attack the Canaanites? And the Lord answered Judah. And then you see that Judah came alongside from Simeon and said, hey, if you help us do this, then we'll help you get your territory too. And the Lord gave them victory. And uh, in their first battle, they killed 10,000. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't say that they lost any. So it's pretty cool that, that after, after Moses and Joshua die, we start moving on down that messianic line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good a good observation, Jim. I mean, it obviously does divert along the way here and there, but yeah, I think you can see the tribe of Judah taking a strong position, a, a leadership position throughout. Um, and I think, you know, I think first of all, as the training wheels are coming off and we're learning to govern ourselves, and we have noted this before, in fact, it wasn't too many weeks ago that we remembered that remembering all of the faithfulness of God in all of these different areas and the promises that he's made and the ways that he has come through is so, so critical to, to being able to have the courage that you need. These guys are in a difficult situation. You know, they're starting off fairly fresh with some freshly conquered land. They still got a bunch of enemies in the land. Um, they need a lot of strength and courage and, and hope and being able to remember all of these things, especially in verses uh, in verse three, you know, talking about God's faithfulness and how He's, uh, 
He's been so, so faithful. And I know, you know, one of those, the, uh, I, I, many of you or all of you, I'm not sure, I sent that, uh, that mess, that encouraging message of, of Grant and, and uh, his wife, Aunt Robin, Grant and Robin discussing uh, some of those questions that Steve was asking him. I thought that was just fascinating. And one of the key points that, that uh, when Steve asked them about faith, you know, they were talking about if you don't, if you don't have faithfulness yourself, you can't expect your children to have faithfulness. They're learning by your example. And if you, uh, you know, if you're like wringing your hands, I'm like, I'm, oh my gosh, I'm worried that my children aren't going to trust in you. Well, that's, it. that's a really good indication. You know, you're, you're sitting here wringing your hands and I do it. You know, I, I, I'm concerned for my sons that they'll follow you with all their hearts. But I got to remember, you know, they're taking their cue from me. I don't want them to see me wringing my hands over, you know, th my own issues in my life. Because if they see me freaking out and not having faith and strength and being faithful to God, I don't know how I can expect them to learn by my example. And so the reason I bring that up is because when you see these recitations through chapter 23 and 24 of all of these faithful acts that God has accomplished among them, it is not only for them to be encouraged and to be filled with hope, but it is also to demonstrate that he is a faithful father and he is being a good example uh, for us. And, you know, here's another thing. You know that... Um, you know, there's, there's something interesting when you look at the New Testament writings and, you, and it talks about how the faith in Messiah saves you, right? Well, you know, there's some, there's some kind of discrepancy and some arguing about what that means exactly in the New Testament, because, of course, you can imagine that the preposition, the faith in Messiah, is that what saves you? Your faith in Messiah? Or is it the faithfulness of the Messiah? That, that preposition, in or of or about or around, is really challenging to translate. It's kind of like a, a catch-all um, that you have to apply based on context. And many people have asked over the many thousands of years of studying the New Testament, are we saying that it is our faith in the Messiah that is the redemptive act? Or is it the faithfulness of the Messiah that is the faithful act? I think that's pretty critical distinction. Tracy and then Gracie. I was just saved you or your faith has healed you but but the thing is is our, our faith in him and what he has done because he and what has he saved us from and that's another issue is that mm -hmm. he saved us from sin mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. hear i'm saved and they think i'm going to heaven and i don't worry about anything else saved you he saved you from your sin with the expectation that you would no longer walk in it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's a whole issue there too yeah I agree. Uh, Gracie? I think that the answer to that would be yes. Both <laughs> ways. You've got to have Christ and Messiah and God's work that he has planned for the ages, that he has passed on down to us in all of this that we've been learning. And so it's totally dependent on him. Yeah. But it's to be totally dependent upon my free will to accept that. So, yes, it's both. That's a good call, Gracie. Good call. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an excellent observation. And I, I think that we, we, we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of both of those things. But I think that God's faithfulness is an inspiration to us to be faithful to Him. And we have to have faith in Him, but we also have to be faithful like Him. It is all, it's going right back to that faith versus works, that double-edged sword of, of faith and works, faithfulness and works, trust you know, and works. 
So we, we definitely want to combine those things. And I think that reciting for ourselves and remembering for ourselves continuously all the wonderful things that God has done for us encourages us, but it also inspires our heart uh, to, to, to be faithful to Him as we see how faithful He is to us. That's a really, really good, important point, I think. Um, another, you know, another thing that's really critical, in, and I think you, you are seeing this throughout the book of Joshua, and, 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 you know, I hadn't considered this, but also consider the idea that this book of Joshua is prophetic, perhaps, of the return of the Messiah, Yeshua. Um, and that is the idea that the work never seems to be done. You kind of feel like you're getting, um, I feel like you're getting these, these continuous reminders that, man, oh, there's all these victories happening and we're defeating our enemies on so many occasions, but there's always, it's like all of a sudden, wait, there's another one over there. And oh my gosh, there's another one over there. And, you know, it says that we've wiped out all these people and then Joshua was about to die and he's like, okay, there's all these other people who are left here that seems like they just keep popping up like whack-a-moles. And that you 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 never seem to get rid of them, and I think that is a a powerful spiritual lesson uh, that the work is never done. The, in, in this life, in this flesh, in which you are in, in, in living and inhabiting, the work there are always nations that need to be removed. There is always another battle just over the horizon, and for you, those are spiritual battles. Most most likely with your flesh to overcome your flesh and put down your own selfish desires or lustful desires or evil speech or whatever it is that you're battling with. And, you know, the, the, the fighting stops when you're dead. The fighting literally stops when you're dead. When you die, then hopefully it is said of you, well, well done, good and faithful servant. You put up a good fight and you are enter into your reward. You know, you, you have done battle. Um, that's, that's what I want to hear is, you know, you've done good battle because that's, this is a continuous battle. Um, and you know, there's, there's also this, there's also this idea uh, um, among us that, you know, and I don't, I don't know. I, we talked about this when we were, and this is just about work and being, I don't mean necessarily work and is like the work of your hands, but partially. Um, where, you know, it, it says in, in Leviticus, as it's talking about the priests being trained and the age brackets, you know, for a serving priest, um, you know, it says something about, I, I don't remember what the high end cap on the priesthood was, but there's a certain point where it's expected that you're going to quote unquote retire. But notice that it didn't really say retire and go off to your home and just stay there and you're no longer of any use to anyone. Uh, because that, I think that is, that is uh, such a tragedy, I think, that we don't utilize the wisdom and uh, the, the insight of our elders who uh, in this day and age and for a long time, we just kind of, shuffle them off to a retirement home or into the back, you know, into the back 40 in a little home of their own or into the back of the house or something and kind of put them out to pasture, so to speak. I think, you know, that there's so much um, wisdom and, and life remaining in a lot of people who retire that, that we need to figure out a way to embrace them and their wisdom and be able to have an avenue for them to continuously um, lead and guide the younger generations. I mean, you see here that Joshua seemingly was pretty actively engaged right up until the time he died. The same thing with uh, Moses. You know, these guys, they were working and, and, and you know, but you see that you know, he took some advice from his father-in-law because he was, you know, 80 when they left Egypt, approximately. Take some advice from Yitro, his father-in-law. Man, you're going to wear yourself out. You probably ought to delegate some of that responsibility, and that's a good piece of advice. But Moshe continued to work and lead until he was 120, and, just, you know, God took him. He died. Uh, so I think... Um, the work is never done, and I think, unfortunately, we, we cut off our nose 
uh, when we when we kind of embrace this idea of of uh, just you know retiring and just going off and you know doing whatever. I think if you to the degree that you can, it might be you know that you're working in your field you know to train and to help the younger people to learn the things that you have learned over these years. But I think more importantly would be the spiritual things that you have learned. Hopefully. You know, you have a good relationship with your children and you're able to influence them still and your grandchildren. Uh, that's, you know, that's important, I think. Um, I threw that verse into the chat, Alan, about the retirement of the Levites. Oh, you did? What did, what was it, what did it say? It's, uh, from the age 50 years, they shall cease waiting upon the work and shall serve no more, but shall minister with their brethren in the tent of meeting to keep the charge and shall do no service. Thus shalt thou do unto the Levites touching their charges. Yeah, so that to me speaks of a partial retirement. Does that seem right, likely to you? There's like yeah. certain things that they're like, okay, you can kind of back down from this, but we still want you to be here and we want you to be around and we want you to help serve. And, and I'm assuming that it's a, probably about uh, taking up mentorship, frankly, more than anything, to lead the younger priests. So I think that this idea that there's never the work is never done. I, I think we shouldn't give up. I, I mean, I, God bless me. I hope to be of good health and continue on as long as I certain as long as I can uh, to to do something to be generative to help people. I don't know if it's in my area of work or spiritually or whatever, but I hope to be able to uh, continue going for a long time. You know, we'll see what the Lord has in store. But, uh, you know, the, the, in verse 6, you, you note here that this message is very simple. There's no innovation. There's nothing new going on here. It's a simple message of the Torah that is all that is needing, that is all that is needful here. And the most important element of that is our willingness to hear and obey is often the missing ingredient that w why things fail and things come apart at the seams is because we're not willing to, to listen and obey uh, that's the missing ingredient. But is, is verse 6 the definition of courageous? Because remember in the beginning of the book, we said courageous to be strong. Yes. Yeah, Angela. The definition of courageous right Yeah, Angela has mentioned that this, and I have that in my notes here, uh, that verse 6 is like... Um, is this the definition? She asked, is this the definition of courageous? Because we kept seeing this same be, be of great courage and be very courageous in the beginning of the book of Joshua. Right here at the end, we're seeing it again, um, where it's like talking about courage and, and being courageous. It's a good point here. So when you read this, verse 6, and be ye very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the Torah of Moshe, that you not turn from it either from the left or the right. I think that's that's probably a good uh, a good prescription for being um, courageous is to to fill your heart and your mind with the words that are written in the book of the Torah and to uh, not turn from it to the left or the right and do all that is written in it. That is going to definitely help you to be courageous. I, I certainly would think so. Good observation, Angela. Now, something that was interesting to me, uh, and this is one of those nuggets that kind of stood out, there's a, there's a handful of these, is in verse 7. Um, uh, several commentaries that I looked at it kind of had like little flashing neon lights going on here around verse 7 where it says, you know, do not enter among these nations that remain among you, and you will make no mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, nor serve them, nor bow yourselves down to them. Uh, this seems to be like the um, the very like a four or five part, depending upon the way you interpret these Hebrew words, it's like a four or five part definition of worship. What does it mean to worship? Whether through idolatry or true worship of God. And you know that uh, we have talked before about I the idea of worship. This is not like the church band up on the stage jamming out on their guitars. You know that, that I don't mean worship in that way. That's like praise. That's not really worship. Uh, but worshiping God 
it, when you when you see this, you're seeing um, in the Hebrew a couple of interesting things, uh, making no mention of their names. Now, I have kind of thought maybe this could be busted, busted into five separate categories. You shall not name them, neither shall you mention them. But it's probably more accurate to say you shall not mention their names. But in the Hebrew, I think there's a possibility that you could break it into a fifth and say you shall not name them or mention them. And, and I think naming and mentioning are two, dis, they have a distinction there. Naming something is identifying it by its character, uh, elaborating on it. You know what I mean? We, we know from name, it is not just what your appellation that someone calls you, but your character. Uh, the, the content of your character is encompassed in your name at least a lot of times in the Hebrew Bible, because these, these names mean things. I mean, a lot of us Americans are named things that don't really mean anything. They're just, I don't know where our names came from, God knows, but they're, they don't have the kind of meaning that like Hebrew names have. Uh, and so we, we, we do recognize that a person's name often denotes their character and the content of their character. And so... You shall not name these false gods. You shall not mention these false gods. You will not um, cause to swear by them, serve them, or bow yourselves to them. Now, you can break that apart, and I, and I definitely recommend that you do so, to just kind of make a, uh, a note to yourself on verse 7 here in chapter 23 that these are the elements of proper worship of God, and I think they're also the elements that can lead to a false worship of God or idolatry. Because I have looked at this, when you like mention their names or name their names or make mention of them, you, attribution brings power. Do you know what I mean by the, the word attribution? It's like attributing something to someone. For example, um, making mention of God as being the, the author of the, of the good things that have happened in your life. You know, whatever you attribute the things that happen in your life that are good, you would say, God is good. He brought me a blessing. Okay. If you say, uh, if you say for the sake of discussion, oh, I got this fat check from the government. Well, you're making attribution to the government. Now, is that an act of worship? Not necessarily. It could be, I suppose. I know there are plenty of people who worship the government. Uh, but I, I would say they look to the government for all their help. They ad attribute their politicians. You know, this is stuff that people do. Absolutely. They have a false worship system around the government. But I think that if you attribute the things in your life, whether for good or ill, like Job did, Blessed be the Lord, even though he kill me, I will still worship him. He brings the good and the bad. All things happen for good for those who love him. So attributing things to God, that's mentioning the names and, 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 and mentioning things. Swearing by them, in, like invoking as a powerful, unseen, all-seeing witness. Um, serving them either by offering or by sacrifice or bowing yourself to them either prostrated with your face to the ground as an act of worship or in prayer in a manner of prayer uh, seeking a redress of grievances or seeking a petition so these are the elements of worship and they can go into false worship or true worship any questions comments or concerns about that I just thought that was uh, an interesting section. And you can definitely tear apart those, those Hebrew words and go into some depth there and probably make some interesting discoveries regarding true worship. I think that's a nice little nugget there. Um, in verse 9, you see, uh, it says, For Yuvah has dispossessed from before you great and strong nations. Um, you know, recognizing the source of your blessings, and this goes right along with verse 7, um, that great feats have been accomplished through you or to you, and you cannot claim credit for them. Uh, you know, in, in America and in the West especially, we have a very strong tradition of in fierce independence. 
And that is, un unfortunately, we often attribute things to, we don't really have a sense of, uh, of a society working together or a community or a, like these tribe kinship things. I, I mean, songs have been written over the decades, you know, the family weakens by the lengths we travel and these, these, this clan mentality and watching out for each other and clinging to family. Um, and, and, and we are really much more want to say, I am intelligent, I worked hard, uh, I put in a lot of effort. Uh, we are very fiercely independent. And we often, I think, I think we worship the works of our hands in the West a lot more so than in other cultures because we are so fiercely independent. And it's really a very individualistic uh, society. And so our sense of community and our sense of family and our ties are, are really, uh, really weak. Uh, you know, when I go, for example, to my, uh, my Thanksgiving with our family, you know, uh, we, we do still get together with our family, um, on Thanksgiving but I don't see those people very often, so I cannot claim to have a, you know, like a tight relationship with these people because I don't really spend a lot of time with them. And that is the way it's been for my family for a long time. I mean, when we uh, celebrated Christmas and Easter and stuff, those were the times when we actually saw our family. But other than that, we didn't really spend a lot of time among them. Um, and if I take, you know, if I go to my family reunion every year on Thanksgiving and I take a picture and there's like, a hundred people there. It's a big family. And, you know, I'll post a picture on Facebook or something. I, I used to do that. I haven't in a while. But people are like, my gosh, what, who are all these people? That's like, that's, that's literally, there's a couple of friends mixed in there. There's probably 10 or 15 friends mixed in there, but that's literally all family. And people are like, they don't have families like that anymore. They just don't even really get together once a year or something. So that's, it's interesting but we also have such an individualistic bent. And um, I think that it's, uh, it makes it hard for us to recognize the source of our strength because we, we often tend to, to attribute that to ourselves. And I think when I mentioned attribution before, to what do you attribute the things that are good in your life, um, I think we can sometimes also be kind of trite with our, our comments as like, oh, God is good, you know. You know how many times you hear that from well-meaning Christian people who just kind of, it's like this trite thing that you just kind of throw off the cuff. And, and people, if they think that you mean it at all, might just kind of roll their eyes because it sounds like some kind of you know, religious platitude. Um, and I think we probably ought to find a better way to express that uh, than just saying, you know, God is good, or you know something like that. I know maybe back in the day it was it was perceived in a different way, but it feels like to me these days it's just kind of trite. It's it's uh, it's not working as well, Tracy. Something I liked that I learned from was reading a response from Jacob when someone was I don't know if Esau someone was asking who his children were. And his response was, these are the children whom Yahweh gave me. Yeah. I'm like, you know, that's what I need to keep in mind. Like, even introducing my, my daughter to the child that God gave me. If he's mm. mine, at least let me have her for a little bit, you know? Yeah. And then also that the flesh wants recognition. The yeah. flesh wants credit. Yep. And that's something, and that is because it's the Babylon mentality. It wants to build a name for itself. Yep. And so we have to be broken of that by his spirit to build a name for him and decrease while he increases. I think you're absolutely right. And I also think, I also think that um, because of our strong reliance and attribution to ourselves, especially in the West, this is why we are awash with anxiety and depression in the West. And a lot of other places aren't. Because they attribute, even if they're in idolatry, they often attribute things to other people. 
You know what I'm saying? They, they attribute either they've got a, in some other cultures, and I'm talking about non-Western cultures, there's such a, a leaning on each other mentality that they don't attribute everything to themselves like we do. And they're also, that makes them, res it makes us responsible. If you take on that kind of responsibility, then you, you really are feeling the weight of, it's up to me. You get, the, you get the credit for the good, but you also get the credit for the bad. And all the weight of, man, if this is all up to me, does, could you not just, can you not just sense the anxiety dripping as I'm even talking about this? I mean, you, when, you, when you just feel like, man, this is really up to me. It's either because of my education or because of the hours that I put in at work or, you know, uh, it, it's... Um, I got to tell you, this is kind of interesting. I have, a couple of years back, I recommended a book about marriage to you guys from Rabbi Shalom Arush, and uh, it was called The Garden of Peace. It was a fantastic book, and I, I, I still recommend it to this day regarding marriage issues. Not issues, but just how to have a good and happy marriage. It's not like any marriage book I had ever seen in my life. Well, he also wrote a book about faith. It was called The Garden of Emunah, The Garden of Faith. Also, fascinating and wonderful book about what does it mean to have faith. And a lot of those same principles from that book he has carried over into this other book that I am reading it currently with my children, which is, uh, I don't remember what the title of it is, but it's about faith and money. Uh, so my, my children and I have been reading this book by Shalom Arush, Rabbi Shalom Arush, uh, about faith and money. And uh, man, these guys have such a, a weird, weird idea about money. It's like you have absolutely like nothing to do with it. And it's hard sometimes to kind of balance that with our Western minds. My kids are sometimes saying, man, dad, he really seems to be saying that you should do nothing but sit on your hands and God's going to give you exactly what you deserve or what, what is coming to you or what has been decreed from heaven for you. And I'm like, but then he comes around and kind of puts in some caveats where you know he's not, no, he's not just saying you're going to sit on your hands and God's going to provide for you whatever he was going to provide for you, whether you work or not. That can't be the case because we know that there's six days you're supposed to work. But it's, it's very, it's such a very different cultural perspective of looking at this Hebrew perspective of faith and money. Um, very weird. Very interesting, though. And it's, it's, it's been such an eye-opener for me and my children to look at this uh, really providing attribution to God and saying, God is going to give me exactly what I need. And it reminds me so many times throughout this book, I've, as we've been reading, it is just directly tied to the Yeshua's teachings in Matthew 5 through 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you know, don't worry about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink. Your, your Father in Heaven knows that you need these things. I mean, this rabbi is basically saying the same thing. It's exactly the same teaching. A lot more words, but it's the exact same teaching. But it's been very, very eye-opening um, to, really, to really learn to not worry about, you know, it's not on my shoulders. I have a responsibility to work, and I have a responsibility to do my diligence for six days a week to put in my effort but I also have to leave the results to him entirely. It is not a matter of my effort. It is not a matter of me freaking out and wondering what am I going to do here and just scrambling and thinking, it, because that's the way we think as a, as a nation and as a group of individualistic people who really rely upon ourselves for our own success. Um, and that, to me, in my mind, and I'm guilty of idolatry to the extent that I do that. Uh, I have to recognize the source of everything in my life and remember to come up with better ways to express that to the people around me, especially unbelievers. These are the children that God gave me. You know, this is, this is the, these are the two boys that I have charge over that God has given into my care for a time. I, you know, I don't know how you want to, but maybe, you know, give some thought to how might you express your reliance upon God in a way that, is a good and faithful example rather than just something trite that, that like everybody would say. Um, now, go ahead. Now, I would love to get information on those books. Um, if you would be willing to send maybe to Carlos email address, because I don't think we have one, but um, send that information to her on that 
the author and knows the name of those books. And maybe some of the other people would want that information too, but I would love to get those books. Yes. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. If I, if I didn't ask now, I would have forgotten the I should have asked the Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, so well, I will actually uh, most assuredly send a, uh, a notification here. Uh, let me just, um, I'll just go ahead and take a moment right now and just kind of send out a message to everyone. You can make a note of it, but I'll also include it in an email later. So there is his name, Rabbi Shalom Arush, and I, I believe he's written like five books, but the, the, the ones that I'm talking about are The Garden of Faith, which is about faith, The Garden of Peace, which is about marriage, and um, something about money. I don't remember the title of the one about... Bones they need to spit out. Yeah. Oh, there are definitely some bones that you need to spit out in those works, but I know you guys have wisdom enough. My children... My children have wisdom enough to read those books and say, this is amazing, this is great stuff, that's stupid, throw that out the window. Yeah, it's real easy to see. It's not like you need to have this super discernment and wisdom to read this and go, oh, that's a little, that's, you know, you'll see it real easily. Um, but yes, I, I, I definitely heartily recommend them. But uh, I was going to bring up to you um, in, in verse 12, uh, this is this is fascinating in chapter 23 verse 12 where it says if you in any way go back I mean, that's what is what is my translation the Darby translation that I often use it says if you in any way go back and what's interesting is in the Hebrew it is not put forth as an emphasis it is turn turn if you like shuv turn turn. It says it twice. And in our English translators have said, if you in any way turn and go back towards the people of the land. And, and you know, and we have talked about this on many occasions before, that whenever you see something repeated in the Torah, yes, it can be used for emphasis. I, I totally understand that. But I think that there's, there's often a deeper spiritual message that you can learn when you see a Hebrew word re repeated twice. I don't think those, I think there's an economy of words in, in Hebrew and it's, it's a packed language. And when you see a word repeated twice, you got to perk up your ears. Uh, but two things caught my attention in verse 12. It says, turn, turn, or if you in any way turn back towards these nations. I don't know exactly what to, what to do with a double turn. Because frankly, if you're turning twice, what are you doing? You're turning around in a circle. Yeah. That's if you take it literally. Angela? Physical turn, spiritual turn, that might be a way to look at it. Did somebody unmute themselves because they wanted to say something? Hi. Um, I just think this is a premise that I always use with my counseling, that there are no examples in the Bible where we don't flee or turn in the face of sin and temptation. Hmm. We don't stand there. There is no example in the Bible where we stand there. Mm -hmm. We need to flee and turn at, at the very beginning because otherwise there is no examples where we have victory where we don't do that. Right. Right. And I think that's a good opportunity. That's a good option. Uh, a good observation, Jan. Thank you. Tracy. Yeah, and that's, you know, something that we often see is repenting, shuv, teshuvah, is turning away from your sin and turning towards God. But this is in the opposite direction. So if you turn back towards these nations, and I think if Angela mentioned a moment ago, I think that's probably a good idea. If you turn back toward these nations, turn, turn, could be turning spiritually and emotionally with your eyes and then your body is following suit. And I think that's probably a good way to look at it. What Tracy said is good 
too, because they turned once, turn again, and now you reverse. Yeah, that yeah, there there might I think there there's definitely something to this idea of turning once and then turning again. You're you know, you've done a three hundred and sixty degree turn, Tracy. But that's what you know, that's what it says in the New Testament several times is that if you turn away and your your clan your house is cleansed, but then you go back mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're worse off than you were before. So right. it, there's the Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's that's an excellent, excellent observation. I, what it means both. Yes, it's not one or the other. <laughs> turn, turn, or turn with your heart and your mind, and then turn. Because I think that Angela's point about turning one way, turning spiritually or with your eyes, and then turning with your phys, you know, because you're you're with your eyes, and Yeshua gave us some excellent lessons about how it starts in your heart. It starts in your eyes, it enters into your soul, and then the next thing you know, you're walking right after it. So it manifests itself in two ways. Uh, Jan? Alan, uh, I think he's talking about the animal soul and the godly soul, all of who you are. Mm. And that's what you're talking about. It's just a different, yeah. different culture. Right, right. And I think, you know, the other part of verse 12 that is also very interesting is that when it says you make marriages uh, to them, to attach yourself to them. You know, what's interesting about this, and I didn't quite quite capture this uh, until today, is that there are different expressions for attaching yourself in marriage in Hebrew. Uh, this word for intermarry in Hebrew, it, uh, the word is uh, katan, and it, it, it literally means to lose a daughter to another family. It is not talking about a male bringing a daughter into his house to, to, to grow his family. It's literally about you losing a daughter and go, she's becoming a member of someone else's family. Uh, and I think that's significant because when you are, are, are contemplating turning back towards what's interesting as, it's, as, as it stands, and we'll talk about that in a minute, During turning back, wait a minute, we only just came here and destroyed these people. How could we be turning back to them? Well, that's a key point. We'll come up to that in a second. But um, when you turn and attach yourself to them or intermarry with them, give your daughters to them, it's, it's, it's really about you losing a part of yourself and it's getting sucked into their rabbit hole, if you want to put it that way. But also note that the word katan in Hebrew in this context here, the first time it's used is when Shechem is raped Jacob's daughter and says, make an agreement with us and we'll all intermarry together and it'll be great. Uh, that is a real key flashing light that says, yeah, this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. So I thought that was, that was certainly, uh, certainly interesting. And in verse 13, you've got the results of turning away. And these are, these are fascinating to me. If you look at the progression, you know, it, 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 it's like turning away from Yuvah and turning your heart away from Yuvah, your heart first through your eyes and then your actions. It, it, it starts this negative downhill process. And I know that you have seen it either in your own life or in the life of others around you. Gracie, go ahead. Are you going to talk, Gracie? Yeah, go ahead. I have to remember to make my finger work on that button. <laughs> Jerry mentioned in Hebrews, I think he said 10, Hebrews 10. it talks about if you've gone with Christ and then you turn back away from him, how can you come back again to him? And I think it's talking about that. We're talking about right here, too, isn't it? Camping his blood, there's no more yeah. remission for sin. I mean, you got Christ and you don't, and you say that's not enough, then too bad, because mm -hmm. there's nobody else. Like yeah, no, I think you're right. I think that's also the section where it talks about like it's like a dog returning to its vomit. Uh, you know Same that. Thing. Yeah, that's that's a that's a, a challenging thing when you you turn away from God. Um, but you know, it always ends with the same thing. Is like number one, the first step is that the good blessings start to slow down and then become a trickle. 
It's like the good things, the blessings, the life, the peace, the, the, the plentifulness. The, and it could, be, it could be both spiritual and temporal blessings because I think, I, I personally think that we, you know, we got away from the temporal blessings in our Christian tradition because A, we wanted to break away from the Torah and the Torah has a lot to say about temporal blessings. We also wanted to denigrate our Jewish brothers and sisters by saying, oh, you guys can have the temporal blessings. We'll take the spiritual blessings. You know, I don't know about you, but I am not an entirely spiritual being. I am living in the flesh on this planet, and I need temporal blessings. I need money. I need health. I need victory over my enemies. You know, whatever those things are, I'm a living person. I need those things. And I think, A, we kind of poo-pooed that and shoved it off to the side because of our Christian Christian tradition that's like, no, 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 no. You know, we've got this idea that we're supposed to be poor and humble and blind and stupid and just, you know, crawling in the gutter and just going, I, everything's going to be better in the next life. It's like, n- I don't really think that that's the goal that we're supposed to shoot for. I mean, you know, sometimes, yes, you're living in a society or a culture or a time in the world when things are rough and everybody's just poor and you're living in a third world country or something. But, I mean, wasn't the whole purpose that you would see these, these an abundant life, as my father just said, that, that these nations around you or your friends or your family members or other peoples would look at you and say, man, why do things just seem to happen so good for you? Why are things good for you? Why do you seem to be at peace even when you really shouldn't be? Why are your children more behaved than mine? Why do your children not behave like mine do? Why do you not behave like I do? Why do things just seem to work out for you? I think we, we kind of jettisoned that and hyper-spiritualized things to a degree that we were like, well, we're just going to take the spiritual blessings, and gosh, those spiritual blessings are tremendous. But we're alive here, folks. We need temporal blessings. And I also think, unfortunately, that some of our Christian ministers began to preach this prosperity gospel that was a mix of witchcraft and God knows what else. You know, send us five bucks and you'll become wealthy. This wishful thinking, like the secret kind of stuff. It's some kind of magic words or magic formula that's going to make you rich. We shot ourselves in the face. But I think... Unfortunately, we see when your heart begins to turn from God and that you start to travel the the wrong path and you have shooved in the wrong direction that the blessings dry up. That she's bouncing around over there. She must want to say something. What do you want to say? Do you have more to say? I have more to say, but I want you to... Your blessings dry up. Your blessings dry up, what yes. Did you just say? I said, your blessings dry up. What? Well, the first time you see Shuv in the Bible, it's together. There's two of them. Not right next to each other, but they're together. Okay, hold on. Angela says, the first time you see Shuv in the Bible, there's two of them. They're not right next to each other, but they're together. We're gonna, she's going she's gonna to say something. Here it okay. comes, folks. When we run into these situations where you see the same word next to each other, I think it's like telling you to go, go look at that word. Go look at where it's happened. How did it start? Maybe do even a one of those full studies where you look up every instance of that word, which with the, with with this word, that would be like, a long time because there's a lot of them but if you look back at the first time that this word occurs it's in genesis 319 and there's two of them in 319 they're not not right next to each other but this is when the ground gets cursed because adam listened to the voice of his wife oh. and ate of the tree and so thorns and thistles shall the ground yield you in the sweat of thy face thy sh- thou shalt eat bread until thou return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust thou art and unto dust you shall return. Yes. So there, I think there's something to be understood about return, return, dust and drying up and listening to the woman and not doing doing the wrong thing. <laughs> I, I thank you All for the wrong direction. no. That's excellent, and I thank you for pointing that out. I did actually look at the first place that 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 appeared when I was doing my research, and I saw that it was talking about. No, 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 no. 
uh, I saw that it was talking about, you know, you came from the dust and to the dust you will return. I thought, well, that doesn't, that's, it's talking like death. You're going back into the yeah, dirt, which is, what which, is, if they turn, turn right which is what happens when you turn, turn. And also when you turn away from God, I mentioned, which is what they did. right. I mentioned a moment ago that your blessings begin to dry up. Oh. And that made you think of returning to the dust where there's no moisture yeah, there. Yeah, it, you're going to get thistles and briars growing instead of fruit. And I think that definitely is the first stop in the runaway downhill train when you turn from God. Is first thing that happens is God's favor and blessings dry up. And then, of course, the negative things start. So the, the good things stop, and you're kind of free floating there for a minute. It's like neither good nor bad, but you know it's headed in the wrong direction. And then bad things start to happen. The negative effects start to crop up. And finally, it's an endless succession of evil happenstance. Uh, so it just continues. You're on a downhill, you're on a downhill ride. Well, and you, the, get, you get pushed to the east of the garden and the angels won't let you back in. Yeah, you get pushed to the east of the garden and the angels are standing there with their flaming sword and they won't let you back in. Uh, and and I, he has just brought his people from the east. And he has just brought his people from the east and has brought them back west into the garden, so to speak. So, yeah, this is all coming together very nicely. Um, And I think the whole purpose here is to get your attention. And it's a matter of how stiff necked are you? Because you can probably when you notice that your blessings are starting to dry up, maybe it's a good time to shuv and to turn back to Yuvah. Uh, And that's one of the things that Rabbi Shalom Arush mentions in his teaching that we were reading about the the faith and the and uh, money it's like if you notice that money troubles are starting to crop up you might need to contemplate what's going on in your life they, they always start there so do a careful evaluation of your behavior i think that's an interesting observation well in this verse the, the turn to the first turn turn verse his bread is being eaten by the in the sweat of his face yeah so he is yeah, he's he's turned he's doing more work here for less for less results when in the garden. Yeah, he's going to work by the sweat of his brow. So his material blessings is one of the first things that he loses uh, in the garden because of the fall. Fascinating stuff. And I think in Joshua twenty three fifteen you can see Joshua is actually prophesying that he knows that they will completely fall away from God, we're gonna do it again. and we're going to do it again, huh? Yeah, we're going to continuously do it again. He knows that it's going to happen. And we're probably doing it again. And we're probably doing it again right now. So, but, I, but I, tell you, I tell you, though, that, and I, and I want to continuously stir you up by way of reminder that when things went bad in Egypt, life started getting hard, the economy started contracting, they started taxing you, they started misbehaving towards you, making you make bricks without straw, life's getting rough. That's when you turn to God. And I say, we're stiff-necked like that. Just don't turn again before he don't, takes you across the Yes, road. and that's a good point. Angela said, just make sure that you don't turn again before he delivers you out of Egypt and delivers you across the Jordan into the garden. Because now's the time to turn once, not turn twice. I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, and I'm going to move forward just a little bit into chapter 24 because there's a, most of this is a history lesson, and we're you know fully aware of these things. But um, you know we've got a historical recitation of all of these uh, you know wonderful things that God has done. Um, and again, why do we repeat these things so often? Well, it's because we have to continuously remind ourselves of all of the help that God has given us and all the victory he's given us in our lives because we are, we are very, very, it's very easy for us to forget those things. Um, and, and, and we have them at frequent intervals. Uh, you notice that at each generation. It seems like every approximately 40 years when the children are growing up and, 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 and are able to stand on their own two feet, that we're having this renewal of the covenant process where somebody is getting together and talking to them about the responsibilities that they have um, 
and is telling them, you know, remember all of the things that Yehovah has done for you, and now you have to make a decision. Uh, we see this happening uh, repeatedly, especially in the Torah and in this, uh, you know, the, it's like you get to a certain stage and it's like, okay, you realize what has happened here. You, 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 you know, you've been listening to everything we've been talking about. It's time to make that dedication. You know, this actually reading this, I was reminded of like the frequent altar calls that would happen in like the Baptist church or it's like, you know, somebody gets involved in this, you know, they want to get involved with God and they get, make an altar call and they dedicate themselves to God and then they go on their way and, you know, you see them down there doing another altar call, you know, three or four months later. Um, and I used to say, well, that's, gosh, man, that person must be struggling. And I would continue to say that. But but it also occurred to me as I was reading this, it's like, you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing. <laughs> it's people just continuously turning back to God and 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 kind of stumbling around and I don't know if you guys had uh, have actually been watching the new season of The Chosen. Have you? Yes. Okay. Out of the last episode that just came out, Mary of Magdalene was hanging out with Yeshua and his disciples, and she decided she was going to go back to the bar and get some liquor. I was like, what? <laughs> what is going on here? You just don't expect that in a show about Jesus and his disciples. But you know what it made? I thought... Why wouldn't you? She had a difficult day. She had a hard time. She came, in, she came in contact with a demon-infested person, and it reminded her of her own past, and she just got emotionally charged, and she decided to bounce. She took off, left all the other disciples, and went back to the city and decided to go and get some, get some liquor or some drugs. I'm not quite sure. The episode was kind of left hanging there, but I was like, my gosh, I, I wouldn't, why wouldn't they? Some of them struggling. I mean, we know Peter decided, I'm, I'm going fishing, you know, I'm, I'm done with this, you know. So I don't know why I wouldn't have expected that. But this new season is fantastic. If you haven't been checking it out, you should definitely take a, take a gander at that. Um, something interesting. Did you notice here that we, where is our tabernacle set up? Do you remember where the tabernacle is set up right now? It's in the land of Ephraim. It's in Shiloh. The, ty- the, the tabernacle is set up in Shiloh, and yet in verse 1 of 20, chapter 24, it says that everybody goes to Shechem. Um, do you wonder why that is? Do you remember some significant events that happened in Shechem? The two mountains, the blessings. Yeah, this is, Shechem is the town, you know, with the two mountains on either side, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, uh, where, yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Dinah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Death, death circumcision, thanks to Dinah when she got, you know, snatched up and raped by Shechem. Um, but yeah, you, you, you know, one thing is that when Abraham, because you remember he's about to mention Abraham here. When Abraham first turned away from idols and fled the land of the north or the, and the east and the north and then entered into the land of Canaan, the first place he stopped was Shechem and he set up an altar there. Also noticed when he returned from Egypt after his misadventures in Egypt that he went back up towards Shechem. Uh, notice also that Jacob and his family traveled to Shechem and it was there that he said, take away the idols from among you. And they buried those idols under the terebinth or the oak or whatever tree in Shechem. And I think that it is, it is a historical reference point. I mean, I don't know, you guys, um, who's that guy who traveled? Ray Vanderland. If you're familiar with Ray Vanderland, that guy's spectacular. You can see, you know, he'll go to uh, stand on a mountainside right next to the Sea of Galilee and read the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, you know. And it's like just being in that location and listening to those words is significant somehow. It just takes on new significance. It just feels different. And I think that this is part of the thing that is just surround, immersing yourself in it 
uh, to such a degree by re -go you know, rejoining the place where your ancestors had significant things happen in Shechem. And, and here he actually says, uh, you know, he says twice to these Hebrews, get rid of the idols among you. Now, you might think to yourself, well, certainly he's speaking spiritually or metaphorically, but I don't know that he is. I mean, is it possible that they, they literally have idols among them at this point? It certainly could be. It certainly could be. Because we have several references to the idolatry of Egypt, the spiritual darkness of Egypt. It seems very clear to me from several passages in the prophets as well as the Torah that these Israelites, these Hebrews were indeed involved in idolatry in the land of Egypt. And he, Joshua references it directly here. He also references the idolatry of the land of Canaan. Now, they've only been amongst these Canaanites for seven years once, they, once we broke off from the narrative last time. But remember, another good chunk of time here, this says at the end of Joshua's life. So they've been living there for some time now, possibly 30 to 40 years. And it seems to me that it is entirely possible that the corruption, the turning at least with the eyes, has already started. But the notice, notice also that this text at the end of this chapter says that the, um, that the Israelites were faithful to the covenant, even after Joshua died. Those people who outlived him, that next little bit of a generation who outlived him, who had seen all the things that God had done for them in the wilderness and in the land of Canaan and helping them defeat their enemies, that's like those people remained faithful. But it faded then after that, and we get into the book of Judges and everything goes crazy. But notice that you know, this place, Shechem, is important because it's bringing them to their minds the idolatry that they have purged themselves of in the past, both with their ancestor Abraham and their ancestor Jacob and all of his children. Um, that the, remember also that they went here as soon as they crossed into the land and as soon as they defeated a certain number of peoples where they could move up north a little bit and get to Shechem. This one of the first things they did was go there and pronounce the blessings and the curses uh, at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Tracy? Um, I found the connection in Genesis 35. When you're talking about the idols and the, what's the significance of Shechem, it reminded me of something. Um, that they buried idols there. Mm -hmm. Do you recall this? Yeah. Um, the ones Rebecca had? Did you mention it and I just wasn't listening very good? Yeah, yeah, I mentioned it a moment ago. Um, I don't know if it was the, I don't believe it was the one that Rachel stole from her father. I believe that Jacob said, put away the idols that are among you, and they buried them under the terebinth tree. So I don't know right. if that was Rachel. Uh, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. I was trying to find that. But yeah, that's from Genesis 35. And I don't know, I think he's just talking to his household, his whole household. Right. Then they give him the idols and bury them there. Yeah, so it makes sense that he's. this is his household now. They're much bigger than they used to be, but Joshua is again stirring them up by way of reminder. Our ancestors before purged themselves of idols in this very spot. So I think that that's significant for, for that reason. So, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, now notice, I, I, and I want to just bring to your attention one thing about this, this recitation of history, about all these amazing things that God has done. Um, notice that we have Joshua saying, Thus saith the Lord, I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and I did that. Uh, and he's listing a great list of historical events in which he has rescued their ancestors going back quite a ways. Um, and then in verses, verse 16, they actually make a small list, list. They recite a little bit of history. Do you notice what the difference is there? God's history is long and is considerably in the past. Their recitation of history is short and is from recent past. And it seems to me that there might be a case to be made here to look at this as a, as a, as a type of witness. 
Remember, you need a faithful witness, someone to say what actually happened. God is proclaiming what actually happened before these people were even born. That he, as a faithful witness, is saying, these are the things that I did with your ancestors going way back. And then Joshua issues a call to action and saying, hey, what do you want to do about this information? Are you going to do it? You're going to, let, you're going to you know, and they're like, yes, we're going to do it. And then they list their own list of the faithful deeds of God. And they list the things that had happened in their life. So you have two witnesses, one on either side, one going back quite a ways from God's perspective and one going back a short period of time from their perspective. Did you want to say something about this? No, I thought you were done. Oh, okay. Uh, and then in the middle, you've got this call to action and leading by example where Joshua says, um, he calls them to put away their idols in verses 14 through 15. Did they have any? Perhaps. Um, he leads by example, basically saying, I don't know about you guys, but as for me in my house, and you've seen this thing printed on the wall in many a home, but as for me in my house, we will serve you of ah. Now, but, you know, this is an interesting thing. If it seems evil to you, in verse 14 and 15, he said, but this is literally what the text says, if it seems evil to you to serve you of ah, then don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but as for me, in my house, we intend to serve you, Bob. And then they make their witness. They swear their I do. We have a basically we have a renewal of the covenant here. They're swearing their fealty to you, Bob, and they make a proclamation of the key events that they have witnessed. And it's almost like they're saying, and this is what's kind of weird about this. And it's like. It's it's because I know that we think about what um, Yeshua has said is like blessed are those who see who don't haven't seen and yet still believe, uh, and we Christians have always been of the we like to you know say well oh yeah those those Jews those Israelites you know they 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 could only be faithful as long as they had the the miracles of God right in their face as soon as those things kind of dried up a little bit they just they just moved off. And I think there, there may be some truth to that. But you notice that what is literally being said here is that while the strong physical presence of God is right there in and among them, they're faithful. Somewhat. Not all of them. But the overall, they're faithful. But then when, when the strong presence of God backs off, and we talked about this right at the book of Genesis at the very beginning, where it's like you have to have some separation between you and God, because if you literally have a very strong sense of he's looking over your shoulder all the time, you're not going to sin, because you're, you're very aware of his presence right there. And that's a good thing to a degree, but is it, a, is it a good thing for him to see what's in your heart? What you'll do when he's not looking? No, nah, it doesn't really give much of a test for you to, you become kind of a, you know, you're, you're, you don't have, you're not exercising your free will very much when you're very, very keenly aware of him watching right over your shoulder everything that you're doing. It's good for you, but is it really? Does it really give you an opportunity to show what's in your heart? Now, unfortunately, for most of human history, what's in our hearts does not turn out so well. But I, I hope that we're moving in that, in that direction. And I, and I would say, just from a historical perspective, as a guy who likes history and has you know, been a student of history, that I do tend to think that when the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and that the church, the church age, if you, however you want to look at it, that you know, Yeshua came and the Spirit was poured out and the Spirit of God was given to the believers, that I'd like to think and I'd like to hope that maybe there was a little bit more faithfulness, that there was some progress made. Otherwise, for what purpose did Yeshua come here? Just so we all could believe, oh, hey, look, it's the wonderful thing that God was going to do to save us from our sins, but it really didn't do much. No, I think it did do some things. I think hopefully over the eons it, it, it has had an impact. Angela? Well, you kind of moved off of it. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I don't know. There were some things that you said that made me think of things, and now you've moved Sorry, away from it. Sorry, she's backing up. It's all good. Uh, in, in Joshua 24, 26, and 27, he talks about the great stone that he sets up, and he says that this stone heard all the words of Yehovah. 
Is that the same stone that was split in two? <laughs> well, no, I don't, I don't think. It moved with them, according to legend. Okay, yes, this is true. This is true. Or could it just be like a metaphor for the stone that has been there? You and know, has I have some notes on the stone. Knows their I'll, history. Yeah. No, okay. I, because when you started talking about witnesses, mm -hmm. remember last time we talked, or maybe the time before, there was a pile of stones and we got into a discussion about witnesses. Right. And if you think back in this book that we've been looking at Joshua how many times have they piled up stones they've been piling up stones since the beginning of this book this when they crossed the river well, whenever they killed seemed, a king it twice when they piled up some stones yes and they the river. The, if you go back and read the book from front to be or just listen to it how many times do stones get piled up in this book four or five. I think it's more okay um and and then you were talking about the place, like Shechem having some play, having a significance as a place, and and I think that, and that made me think of like your mom who just drove by the house where she grew up. It's not there anymore, and so she grew up. She uh, drove by the house where you grew up, and she took a picture, because these places on the earth hold significance to us. I mean, how many of you have driven by your childhood house? And does, does, it, does it not make you feel something to be in that location on the earth and, and to, like, recall and remember? It might bring some things closer to mind. There's just something about a place on the earth that helps you remember your past. And something happened in our family. I'm not going to share details, but I had a, a nephew who wanted to have a conversation because he doesn't know anything about his past, and he feels like he doesn't even know his dad. And I am the only person in the family who knows anything about his dad that could tell him something. And me being an introvert and being evasive, I just kind of ducked and dodged the question, but I've been, it's been weighing on me for the past week. And, and this whole section that Alan's reading about, the, a family origin story is extremely important to pass down. And I think that Joshua realizes that in this book, that if you don't pass this story down because those people were not there to see it, you don't pass this information down, eventually you're going to get to a generation that is completely lost and that doesn't even know where they come from, and they're just adrift, and, and things are going to just go really bad for them. And I think that when he started this whole thing tonight, he talked about how we we don't hold our elders close to us, and they used to pass on the family origin story. And this, it, this is the Hebrews passing on their origin story, and they go back to Shechem because there's something there that is important to that story that they need to know and they need to pass on to their children. And you see what happens in the book of Judges when they don't pass it on to their children. You know, that, that's an excellent insight, Angela. And I, and I was just going to say, and I'll catch up to you here in just a second, Tracy, that I have often thought about Shechem as a place even today. Because I know that many of you who have been to Israel know that you, you don't really go to Shechem. It's kind of hard to, to get to Shechem and see the place because it's, it's in control of Israel's enemies. And it's very hard to get there and to see that place. And I have this idea in my mind that when the time comes that uh, something significant happens with Shechem, that might be a significant prophetic thing that happens in the future. But I don't know. Tracy? Well, I think one of the connections that I'm seeing here is the reason he's bringing him back to this location, like she said, is the significance of the family origin is that when they stood on those mountains and said the blessings and the cursings, mm -hmm. So, and that fits right in line with, he said, choose, you want to do the evil side or the good side kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's that significance of a visual. Remember when we stood on these mountains and we pronounced the blood thing, the hearing and obeying the person's on this side and what would happen if we didn't. Mm -hmm. And then it reminds me of this, we were just talking about last at Shavuot, that scripture that talks about the, um, I think it's Zephaniah, and I'll return to them or store to them a pure lip that they can serve me with one accord. Well, that word accord is Shechem. It's the same word. It's one shoulder. So serve me with the right shoulder. Kind of like just putting these pieces together that maybe that there's a connection to the correct shoulder, the two 
Um, the two mountains being the shoulders, that's what Shechem means. They mm-hmm. wasn't clear on that, but Shechem means shoulders, and the two mountains are the shoulders, and there, there's a valley between them. Yeah. Which is where Joseph's bones are buried, which is also interesting considering Ezekiel 37 with the dry bones, and they're in the middle of a valley, and the dry bones were there, and mm-hmm. Joseph represents the house of Israel. So oh, yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of like, location and significance to that area. Definitely. Yeah, I definitely think so. Mike? I'm, I'm just curious, is, is Shechem a large area, or is it a small area? Because Genesis 33 says that Jacob came to Salem, a city in Shechem. Hmm. So is Jerusalem in Shechem? Is Shechem a larger area? Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know the geography well, but I, I do know that Shechem is currently called Nablus, I believe, and you can kind of look it up. I think it's a decent-sized little town right now. And that's, yeah, yeah, it could have been a a regional area in the the days of Abraham. It's certainly possible. It sounds like it might have been, especially like in the days of the patriarchs, like, like a county seat or something, like it was like the head of a region or something. It's certainly possible, yeah. Good question. Um, you know, one of the, the little sections here, and we're almost done, um, in chapter 24, verse 19, Jacob said, uh, uh, jo- Joshua says something kind of interesting. He says, you can't serve Yuvah. He is a holy and a jealous God, and he will, he will not forgive your sins. You know, People had had really no idea what to do with that. Is he literally trying to discourage them from from serving God, uh, saying it's impossible, it's kind of pointless? I mean, you know, if you if you read that literally, you're like, what what is he talking about? Uh, but you know, you might want to look at that because I think there's a couple of different ways to interpret that passage when he says, um, let me just read it for you in verse 19. And uh, after they said, oh, no, you know, we're going to God is the one who did all these wonderful things for us. And, you know, he's our God. And Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve you for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your sins, no, your transgressions, nor your sins. You know, that's uh, what it's not true. So why did he say it? So but the question is, why did he say that? And, and the commentators, if you look at the commentary on this, it's like they're twisting themselves into pretzels trying to figure out what is he talking about. And I think there's a couple of possibilities. Number one, he could, um, you know, Christians, you can imagine in your mind already how Christians might interpret this. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, God's Torah is, is impossible. You know, you, you, you know, the only way you're going to get... Uh, right with God is just through His sheer grace. You know, it's you can't really do it. it, it also says He won't forgive you, which they yeah, and it also says He won't forgive you. So these things are are not that is not true. A and B. I don't think that that is what is being talked about here. Do you need the grace of God because you're not going to keep His Torah perfectly? Absolutely, but I don't think that's what's being discussed here. Um, I think it's, it's more likely that he's testing their resolve. He's using a literally just a rhetorical device. When they say, we're going to serve God, and he says, no, you can't serve God. You notice that immediately after that, in verse 20, they say, no, 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 we totally will. Maybe he's playing reverse psychology. I think that's, I do believe that he is playing a, like a little bit of a reverse psychology game with them saying, no, 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 you can't do it. And they're like, no, 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 we will. But you know what else this made me think of? And this is kind of weird. And I think I may be wrong, but I believe that this passage is where the, the Judaism comes up with this idea. And that is, I don't know if you've heard this before. You can raise your hand or indicate if you've heard this. But it is quite common in Judaism that if a convert goes to a rabbi and says, I want to convert to Judaism, you know what they tell him? No, you don't. You don't want to convert to Judaism. And they send them away. They literally tell them, no, you don't, and they tell them to go away. And then if they come back and they say, okay, I seriously want to convert to Judaism, you know what they do? They tell them again, one more time, no, you don't. And they send them away. 
And it is only on the third attempt that they will say, okay, okay, fine. Now, what this made me think of is, why would they do that? I think it's for the same exact reason that Joshua would do that. It's like, are you sure? I, I really feel like he's being, he's using a rhetorical device with them. I don't think he's literally saying, no, no, you can't serve Yehovah. He will not forgive your sins, and he's a jealous God, and he's holy. You can't do it. I think that's exactly what he's doing. He's saying, this is serious business. You better be absolutely certain. And you know how the rabbis like to build a fence for the Torah. That's, you've heard that. I mean, it's in Perke Avot. They actually say, build a fence around the Torah. I think that this is them taking it one step further. They say, okay, Joshua was challenging these people and saying, no, I don't think you really want to. No, 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 we do want to. They, th they said to themselves, if Joshua did it once, we'll do it twice. That's a fence around the Torah to make sure that the people are really serious and really dedicated. I think that that's what you're looking at here is a rhetorical device that he's using. Um, I don't think he's literally telling them you can't serve your boss. And I also don't think he's telling them the Torah is too hard for you. You can't really do it. The only way this is going to work is by the grace of God. I, although there is some truth to the fact that no one's going to see the kingdom of God without the grace and mercy of God forgiving our sin. No, there's, yeah, there's no grace in what he said. So that's a, that's a difficult one. Um, so I, I hope that that gives you some insight into that because that was definitely a weird little passage, but I wouldn't trip over it. I think it's just a rhetorical device. Um, and then of course you have at the end, you have the stone and the oath. You have them taking an oath, basically saying we will do it. He calls this stone. Now, is this stone, the stone is the witness, uh, Jacob. and Joseph's Jacob, bones. Joseph's bones. Was just talking about, there's the stone at his feet. I know, and Angela talked about this too a little while ago, about how in Jacob's sepulcher today is an actual stone. Nobody knows where the stone came from. If you go to online and you look at like Jacob or uh, Joseph's tomb, in Nablus, there's like this coffin and then there's a stone sitting next to it. I, nobody knows where that stone came from. It's, it's possible. Angela likes to make up interesting stories about what, I don't, I, I mean, use your imagination about what that might possibly be. It could, could it be the same stone? I suppose it could be. Nevertheless, the stone could be the Messiah Yeshua. You can interpret the stone in that way. Um, it's interesting, like she said, that stone, piles of stones and individual stones and 12 stones. I mean, I think ultimately, yes, you're passing on information, calling thing that is being passed on and remembered. Yes, piles of stone are waypoints. They are way markers that remind future generations because stones are timeless. They, you know, if you write the words on a stone, if you recognize a stone as a significant landmark, uh, you know, it's, 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 it is significant. I think it's important. Um, so that's it. That's basically it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the whole of the book of Joshua. We have done it. Thank you, Jesus. Gracie, go ahead. Push the button, Gracie. <laughs> Push the button, Gracie. Push it. Push it again, Gracie. <laughs> she can't push the button. It ain't working. <laughs> you can type your question. Tracy, you want to you want to cover her while she's typing her question or cook treat? I'll, I'll cover. Okay. Um, I I'm sure you noticed, but just to confirm, I think what you were saying about how the Jewish people make them come three times is that he made them say it three times that's true yeah he, he said they said yeah we will he's like uh, 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 you know a little bit later they say yeah we'll do it. he's like no you, you can't do it like, no we're gonna do it and then he's like okay your witness is against yourself and so now now it's official yeah. so he gave them like an ample opportunity yeah i also wanted to point out at the last uh at the very end i think it's just kind of a strange way to end this um book is to say an Eliezer died. Mm. 
um, because I'm wondering if there's some kind of significance as the, this name Eleazar is infamous for being associated with the spirit of God. It means help of God or help of helper, God's helper, you know, and Abraham's um, servant was named Eliezer, and he's this, like, shadow picture of the spirit, and, he went to get the and uh, Lazarus, you know, being this shadow picture of the spirit and all that, so I was just wondering if there was um, anything spiritually to glean from that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm confident that there is. Um, I, I did not, I was not able to dig that deep, frankly, but I think, yes, there are a couple of things and, and two things in specific that I frankly did not have enough time to really dig into this week, and that was the last two events. Number one is Joseph's bones being buried there and then Eliezer inheriting some land there. Uh, yes, I think both of those things are Definitely significant. Uh, I, it, it would be highly interpretive, and you'd probably have to look at some other uh, proof texts to try to bring some meaning into it. But definitely, I, I think it's significant. Um, ask Tracy what happens. Ask Tracy bones, what happens before the bones, before come, the bones back come back is together. Is there anything that's significant pr just prior to the bones coming back together? In Ezekiel. Yeah. Is there um, a wind or is there breath? Well, well, no, the wind brought, and the breath come after, right? Yeah, but he was brought by the Spirit to the valley. Mm -hmm. He was carried there by the Spirit. I just was wondering, like, because I, I was wondering if there was a relation to the, the bones being dried up there mm -hmm. and the Spirit being dead. 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 And then we reverse, we turn. And the spirit... Because the uh, Messiah, when he came, this, this is all prophetic, when he came to wake Lazarus up, he waited mm -hmm. specifically for four days to the fourth day, which is spiritually the 4,000th year when he came to die for our sins and restore their spirit to us mm -hmm. and so that that is I think something that's just really it's amazing to me so I'm just wondering if there's a connection there and that I'm sure there is yeah but that um perhaps this this idea was like he was walking with them he was with them this whole time and now it's kind of something's changed mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Yeah. And now we're, we're in the land and we're expected to live accordingly, but they didn't. Right, right. And that's certainly possible. That's a good observation. Gracie, can you push your button now? You can. We had to go off and start it all over again. <laughs> I see. Um, Lori was saying that, that on the way to Emmaus, when the guys were with Christ on the way to Emmaus, they invited him three times to, to a meal before he agreed to go. And the, what other time Jerry was at? Those are ones I'm like, they, they've asked him. On the third meal, he accepted them. That was the, uh, that seemed to be a cultural thing back in those days. Mm hmm mm hmm So... Yeah, that's... So think of, no, I think that's a good point. Uh, yeah, it's it's like... Um, giving somebody a chance to know it's like really... Yeah, do. giving somebody a chance that, to, to, to really decide, do you really want to do this? And I think if you look at, for example, Jacob meeting his brother Esau and saying, um, you know, I have these gifts for you. How many times did he prevail upon him to take those gifts? I don't know, it's, I don't know if it's three or four, but I'm saying it, that, that could be evidence of that cultural thing that you're talking about, Jerry. And I, I've heard that many times about the Hebrew culture and Middle Eastern culture in particular, where you need to prevail upon someone uh, to accept something from you, and you continue, so they, it's, they push back against each other for a couple of times. It's like when you get someone to pay the check. And they go, yeah, right. Well, you just said the word prevail. That's actually in the Hebrew text. <laughs> when he says you cannot serve Yahovah, it actually says no prevail to serve Yahovah. Mm. So mm -hmm. maybe that, I don't know. If that's, that's yeah, <laughs> that, that's certainly possible. That's certainly possible. But no, that's, that's, there's a lot of, this is, I will tell you, this has been a really delightful study in the book of Joshua. I hope that it was a blessing to you guys and uh, maybe has some prophetic significance. Uh, I think it, it helped uh, me for sure to, I hope, you know, get a better understanding of God dealing with his people. There's just been so many really interesting lessons. Um, as I said, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this up here, and I know it's getting a little bit late. I really appreciate you guys hanging in there with me for this whole time and letting me kind of, you know, finish this book. Mm -hmm.